So if I was a writ of mandum. If I was a smart political science student, which I know you all are, I would <laughs> <laughs> I would definitely remember judicial review. Judicial review, the power of the court to declare an act of Congress unconstitutional. The power that the Boomer Council gave to itself. All right. class um, then Miss McKinney your attendance grade if you like it and agree with it I think you will just sign it and leave it on the table that does not include paying these this these uh we lost my train of thought these four meetings all right, so that's just everything up until April 26th. Yeah. All right, so that is Marbury versus Madison. We pick up now on slide 57. We are in the time of the Roberts Court. Does this work? Yes. I like to walk around. The Roberts Court. The court is typically named, well not typically, the court is always named after the Chief Justice who uh, is leading the court at the time. So that's been John Roberts since 2005. The Associate Justices, Stephen Breyer, you might say Mr. Parker, Stephen Breyer has retired, well yes, but he is still sitting on the court until June. He will still be a justice until June when that question is asked on the final exam. Who uh, is an associate justice on the Supreme Court? Well, Stephen Breyer is Katanji Brown Jackson, has certainly been confirmed and, um, on, as the next associate justice, but she won't take her seat until after. June and the official retirement. Stephen Breyer just heard his last oral argument with the court yesterday. I believe it was yesterday, if not the day before. Um, but they have to write the opinion, and deliver the opinion and all that, and that'll take until June to do, at which point he will leave. Clarence Thomas, Neil Gorsuch, Elena Kagan, Sonia Sotomayor, Samuel Alito, Brett Kavanaugh, and Amy Coney. Barrett, three of the people up here, Trump appointees, um, Breyer, that would have been Clinton, yeah, Thomas would have been uh, Bush Sr., Kagan and Sotomayor, Obama, Alito, another Bush, a Bush Jr. appointee, yeah, so the court is, swings at the moment, 6-3 Republican. So who's who? We'll put names to, faces to the names, rather. Okay, who's the man there? Anybody know? Yeah. Yeah. Anybody know who the man might be? Clarence Thomas. Clarence Thomas. Who's the woman here? It's good to know, you know, just in case they, they occasionally come up on the news. Elena Kagan. How about him? Just no idea, huh? No. This <laughs> is Stephen Breyer. He'll be leaving. 
very shortly. The guy on the bottom there, we didn't get to. It's the chief. The chief's name is, there you go, John Roberts. Yes. Justice Alito. Justice Barrett and Justice Kavanaugh. If you remember the news a few years ago, Kavanaugh faced in the Senate hearings the lady who accused him of, of abuse all those years ago, Coney Barrett. I mean, it's, um, we were talking about this yesterday because you guys in the state and local government class have really started to kind of overlap. Uh, the, the Supreme Court hearings now have just kind of turned into political theater, and they, they perhaps, not perhaps, they shouldn't be that way, but they, they are, at least for the, the moment. Or such, no. And who's the lady who's on Sesame Street? Last one left. Sotomayor, good. My process of elimination. <laughs> you know that that is Sonia Sotomayor. All right, so we look at the sample case here. Hamdan versus Rumsfeld. This case occurred in 2006. Uh, the plaintiff was Hamdan. Salim Ahmed Hamdan, petitioner or respondent, Donald Rumsfeld, who was Secretary of Defense at the time under the second Bush administration. And this case involved Hamdan, obviously. Hamdan was uh, picked up in Afghanistan. He had been, at some point in time, the chauffeur of Osama bin Laden. And we uh, picked him up as an enemy combatant, imprisoned him in Guantanamo Bay, and that was supposed to be the end of Mr. Hamdan. Uh, he filed, though, for a petition for a writ of habeas corpus. Habeas corpus is Latin for produce the body which means he would have had to show up at a, uh, at a court at some point in time. And he filed this in the federal district court to challenge his detention. But before the district court ruled on the petition, he got a hearing from a military tribunal because he was designated as an enemy combatant. And they declared him such. Military tribunals are not fun things. I've never had experience of one. I've heard about them. Uh, you don't want to be subject to a military tribunal. A civilian court is much more likely to respect rights and um, hear what both sides have to say. The rules for military tribunals are quite a bit different than the rules for civilian courts. Ms. Navoa, have you ever heard anything about a military tribunal? I know you're a, you're, you're an air woman. They're just not they're just not the greatest. Yeah, yeah. They are not the greatest, certainly. Yeah, yeah, definitely. So Hamdan's designated as an enemy combatant. A few months afterwards, the district court grants his petition of habeas corpus anyway, and says he has to be given a hearing to determine whether he's a prisoner of war under the Geneva Convention before he could be tried as a military combatant. 
by, um, by as an enemy combatant and tried by a military commission. Excuse me. The circuit court, so one court up, appealed, uh, um, reversed the decision of the circuit court. Um, however, the finding that the Geneva Convention could not be enforced in federal court and that the establishment of military tribunals had been authorized by Congress and was therefore not unconstitutional. So his rights had not been broken, says the Circuit Court of Appeals for the District of Columbia, because um, we can't enforce the Geneva Convention in our federal courts anyway. That's what they say. They said, anyway. So the questions they had to consider. Oh. May the rights protected by the Geneva Convention be enforced in federal court through habeas corpus petitions. Was the military commission established to try Hamdan and others for alleged war crimes in the war on terror authorized by the Congress or the inherent powers of the president? What do we think? Mr. Andrews, have you have a question. So the decision that he was a military combatant got reversed, right? That yes, in the circuit court and then the, uh, then the, the district court, yes, said that. And then the circuit court reversed that decision and said that what happened to him was okay. So, answer yes and no. Yes to the Geneva Conventions being enforced in federal court. Uh, no to was the military commission uh, authorized by the Congress or the inherent powers of the president? Neither. So the Supreme Court 5-3 split. Robert sat this one out because he had heard this while he was, um, he was, Where was he? I don't know. I don't know where was he. Where was he? Uh, ah, he participated in the case while on the D.C. Circuit Court of Appeals. Pardon me. Uh, so, five three, authored by Justice John Paul Stevens, who was a native of this state. They held that neither an act of Congress nor the inherent powers of the executive laid out in the Constitution authorized the sort of military commission at issue in this case. So absent that express authorization, the commission had no choice but to comply with the ordinary laws of the United States and the laws of war. So was Hamdan free to go? Yeah. He was. The military commission, or the military tribunal, excuse me. I don't know what's up with me, but the military tribunal uh, that uh, it was, was not legal. And Hamdan should have been heard in a civilian court. So the Geneva Convention as part of the ordinary laws of war could be enforced by the Supreme Court along with the statutory uniform code of military justice. And as our resident expert, Ms. Navoa, I'm sorry to pick on you again, I have a, a Lieutenant Colonel retired that sits right where you sit in my uh, international relations class. Oh, yeah. And yeah, I, I pick on him a lot and ask him all the military related questions. Can you give a brief rundown of the Geneva Convention? Mm -hmm. That's okay. <laughs> 